All righty. Like Don said, hopefully we can kind of somewhat get together because I had, he didn't tell me I didn't have to do discussion. Matter of fact, there's a lot of discussion in this. So if we can kind of move up forward, I'll give you a couple minutes and I'll explain my, my background, my intro. Don always likes us to uh, give our uh, testimony uh, while we get up here and speak, uh, especially this is my first time um, speaking. I've been up here confessing a couple times. <laughs> but uh, So as you're moving up. So again, my name is Mark Britton. Um, I was born in a Christian family. I think the first week uh, I was in church that following Sunday. So I was uh, born in a Christian home, and what a blessing that has been. And uh, so all through my life, um, I was born here in Three Rivers. And uh, so, um, again, I was in a Christian home. Uh, I went to college and got a degree and, and are working. And, and so I, was, um, I went to... Um, camp when I was 11 years old and was saved and baptized at the age of 11 out of a Bible camp that I went to for, I think it was for a week. And so, but, um, and so we started attending uh, Howardsville Christian uh, Gospel Chapel. We've been there for about, we were there for about 20 years. And, uh, and so I know how some of you are feeling that come from churches that you've been part of for a long time and, and they are your family and then to leave for other reasons, and so um, we did that, and we came here uh, four years ago, three, something like that, four years ago, and so most people know that I'm back there usually <laughs> behind the booth because that's what I do. I'm an IT manager, so I do computer stuff, and that's what I do, and so, but when I first came to the church, um, let me back up in my history. I've done a lot of things in church um, from ushering when I was real small. I remember doing it with my dad. And uh, especially on Sunday evenings, also um, I did janitorial work. I was out of a job, and I cleaned the church. Um, And then I started, I always loved to sing. I did choir with my mom when I was real young. I would sit in the choir and sing soprano at the age of 12 and 13 years old with my mom. So, um, but, um, so I like to sing, and then as Arch at Howardsville, they started progressing towards uh, playing guitar. We were mainly hymns that we sang a lot of, but we started moving to more guitar playing and, and some drums and so forth. And so I uh, took that over and started worship leading for the very first time. And I self-taught myself guitar and started um, doing uh, worship, which, again, I would never think I would have been at up there leading, especially hymns. I remember standing when I was singing out there looking up, going, I don't know if I could ever direct, you know, and you know, how they, <laughs> so, but then coming up on stage, and I was actually leading um, uh, worship, and, um, and that's how I like to worship God, is, is I do it through worship, I like to be here, so when I came here, um, when I came from, I, I did a lot of the technical work in both, and I really didn't want to be back there, I wanted to be up here, and so, and Renee, and Don, they talked to me, and I rested for six months here, and then I came and joined the worship team, and started singing, and then, but God directed me another direction right back there again. That's where my talents are, and so, but you can see that I'm somewhat back up here singing again in the choir with my boy, um, which is a big encouragement. I wanted to be with him as he tried to um, come up front, too, and sing, so I wanted to do that, so, um, so uh, my wife is Tammy. We have four kids. <laughs> Everybody asks me, how many kids you got? And then, well, because a lot of people won't know here we do foster care. And I'm like, well, right now in our home we have this. And, you know, so um, right now we have uh, four kids, and those are our own. That's Marissa. Um, she's home from school right now. Uh, Jacob is our tall son. And Kyler and, um, and Zeke. So uh, usually tell our story, Marissa's our uh, natural child. She was uh, Tammy. Uh, we had her um, 19 years ago. Uh, Jacob is adopted. And so it's Kyler, and so it's Zeke. All three of them are different, done different ways, and so you can always ask our story if you want to talk to us afterwards on how we did that. Um, and so, anyways, Don gave me a big project. <laughs> so, um, so um, I remember last year in Canada, he had me speak, and so he said, well, I heard you speak, now I want you to do Wednesday nights. Let's talk about Wednesday nights. So I'm like, all right, let's go. I'm all, I'm all right with, with that. Let's try it. Um, so we, um, 
been a year. We finally got it. My schedule wasn't a wreck. So we're going to try to get through this. Again, this is interactive, so this is, this is the way I like to teach anyways or in talk because I've done training with things on computers and stuff like that, so I like it more interactive anyways. So, so we're coming off. We have uh, we got the slide up, Brian, my PowerPoint. Hey, there we go. All right. We're in part four of Against the Tide. And my title that he gave me was Think Like a Christian. And he gave me this way back a month ago. And he said, this is your title. I'm thinking, man, what is he talking about? And then he gave me the verses. And I'm trying to put it all together because he gives us his notes. And then we have to fill in and kind of put our own twist on it. So we're continuing off from last week. And uh, that is... Um, of uh, Colossians 2, and then he was doing 1 through 7, and we're up to now verse 8 through 15 as well. So let me get set up here. So last week he ended up uh, with a couple of statements, I think, uh, remember I wrote them down. We need to dig our roots deeper, right? We have to have that root, that, that deep root that he talked about, that we need to have that deep. Another one is to live in Christ, not just for Christ, right, as we come off of that. And so we talked a little bit about sin last week, and we're going to continue with that. He gave me some deep, uh, some deep topics here. <laughs> You're going to make me think about this for a long time. And so uh, I did, which is, it's been great um, to really dig in deep and to, to do this. So, um, so anyways, let's uh, turn to Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 8, and we'll continue reading, reading from there. Um, I think I have it up here. Let's see if I can, actually for a tech guy, I don't know if I can actually do this at the same time. All right, there's verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophies and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits, of the world, and not according to Christ, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power of Full working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in the trespasses and the circum uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This is this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them into the open shame by trumpeting over him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we just thank you for this great word that you've given us and just this whole Bible, Lord, our manual. And again, as we start to look at these points tonight that uh, Paul was talking to the Colossians, I thank you that we can take those same things and apply them today, Lord. And again, we just thank you for the service tonight and everyone that is here tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. So Paul, right away, I don't know if you remember last week, Paul's talking to the Colossians. He's writing them a letter telling them, you're good in your faith, keep it up, you're doing a great job, but see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of his word rather than Christ. He then goes to outline a way of thinking about the relationships uh, with God that is different from anything that the world has ever seen before or that religion has teached before in this. In contrast of that, worldly philosophies teach, um, and then Paul boldly states that everything we need, we have in Christ, right? So it was a very big contrast from what was happening, okay? So the three parts that we're going to talk about, that we're going to study about with Paul that he goes through, this is quite a bit to grasp here um, uh, with chapters uh, or verse 8 through 15. So there's three things we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, the first one is, in Christ, we have the fullness of God. Okay, the second one is that we have forgiveness of sins. 
And the third is, in Christ, we have freedom from the law. Okay? And like with his discussions that we've been having um, with this series, we have this identify the current issue. So let's take our current situation that we're dealing with today and apply them because it sure is relevant from what was happening back then to what was happening today. So today's current issue. A few years ago, a studio religion began working its way into the American mindset. I would say it's a little bit more than just a few years ago, but it was quite a bit of a ways back. <laughs> and uh, so some of these studio, or maybe some of you know, is New Age philosophy. All right. Here's some uh, changing for good, right? Um, Self-book helps, right? We have... Lady Gaga probably giving us some information, some philosophies. I just put that one up there. Uh, they even have, they have the self-help for dummies. You can try to get your self-help from that book. Those are somewhat good books usually. Um, so we get them from, you know, we start to get um, self-help books. We get all this kind of input into our minds, right? Another big one that Don didn't even have in his notes. I don't know if it will come up or not, is Google kind of philosophies. You know, I was reading some of this stuff. I'd Google that, you know, and it's like, man, how do you know if it's true or not, right? Discerning of that kind of information. Is it a good source? I don't know. It has somebody's name on it. I don't know. So, so, if you, um, so these are known as new religion, and there's other things. I mean, you can go into Ophir Winfrey and all kinds of different people, and there's, and what I don't like seeing is, I think, is when pop celebrities they start to promote their own religion beliefs. I think of Tom Cruise, right, and Scientology, right? Oh, you know, everybody wants to now be Scientologist because everybody, you know, our whole society follows celebrities and worships them, and it's like, man, if they're, they're believing in Scientology, and, wow, I better do that because that could probably change my life as well, you know, because how many times they don't start a style of some sort or what they dress, you know, and, and the music that they play or whatever. So we have that. So whether or not you buy into the uh, conspiracy theory, there's nothing new about New Age philosophy or any other humanistic philosophy current on the market. Uh, they have been around for some time and, and for other for centuries, and they have always challenged the most basic spiritual principles taught in Scripture. If you look at that, they just constantly challenge that stuff if we look at the spiritual and, uh, and at the Scripture. Humanist philosophies teach that the that you only need yourself to achieve personal salvation. Right? You only need yourself. The Bible teaches that you cannot do it without Christ. Right? So another, um, I'll put that back up there. Another way to say it is that humanist philosophy, philosophies teach that people are basically good and sin is inconsequential. How many times we've we seen him? Well, you just got to, he's a good person. You just have to be good and things will be great or you'll go to heaven, all right? Anyone who really thinks through this, though, knows that the innocence of that can be lost and that sin is not inconsequential, all right, if you stop and think about it, that we can't do it ourselves. Anyone who's ever tried knows that we don't have it our, in ourselves to save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We need help. Okay. I do have his permission to talk about um, uh, some stories. I was trying to look at this stuff, and I'm like, wow, this is some, sorry, John, um, some deep stuff, and how do I mix in some stories of personal and people we know? So trying to do it yourself. A lot of you know we have little Zeke. We have his bio father as part of our family now. His name is Jose. Okay. So he had a really bad alcoholism problem. Went through a lot of different AAs, all those kind of different stuff. Um, tried all kinds of different means to come out of that addiction, you know, trying to do it himself until it got to a point where he was laying on the floor, getting beaten with a bat, picked up his phone, dialed a number, and that he didn't know who he was dialing. And ended up a guy that uh, said, we'll be over to pick you up. And they took him to a center in Marcellus called Simple Truth Ministries, who is a Christian-based foundation, their church over Marcellus. Uh, ben Lehu runs that. He's the pastor there. It's a, it's a non, 
federal funded. It's a discipleship program. It's a great program. He finally, Jose had to hit rock bottom. Within four days there, he finally, the Holy Spirit found him. Okay, he wasn't reaching out. The Holy Spirit met him in that space. We've been talking about that in church, right? It was a divine appointment at that time that God was there waiting for him to come in. And it saved, saved him. And he's a totally different person now. And he knows now that he couldn't have done it on his own. He's tried it for many, many years to try to quit. That it took God to come and him to accept that, right? And so, um, but uh, again, if you want more stories of that, you can always talk to Tammy and I. That's a great story with, with little Zeke. So, and now he's part of our lives, and we just started, study, uh, celebrated his birthday at our house, and he's constantly over, and, and so it's a, it's a really unique situation that we have with him. So, so the Bible teaches that people aren't basically good. Um, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God or the mark, which is out of Romans 3.23, right? And though sin is not without consequences, God has provided a way, right, for us to, to destroy those strongholds on us. He's provided that way on our lives once and for all. And that is through Christ who died for us on, on the cross for our sins, right? Okay. So like Don would say, it's uh, your turn. I posted some of those things online today. I hope some of you got those on Facebook today. I wanted to put some questions out there. So name some ways our society teaches that everyone is basically good. Anybody have any, what does our society put out there that teaches that everyone is kind of basically good? Or what do you, what do you think people teach on that? Some things that came to my mind. Like nonprofit organizations that are started by people. They want to help United Way. Um, people rallying around disasters, right? Hey, I'm going to go down and I'm going to help the tsunami because they just, oh, that's a good person. There they go. They're going to go down there and help. All right? Anything else you can think of that what society teaches? Everyone is basically good. I think we hear a lot of that. Obey the laws. That's all you got to do. You're good. You obey the law, great. Yep. Renaming our sins as diseases. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. What evidence do you see that is not true? Or what evidence do you see that this is not true, that people are basically not good? Politicians? Wow. I'm not speaking of that. All right. How about crime? We have crime. People can't trust people. Um, people are always backstabbing people. They think they're good. Uh, Tammy and I were kind of talking about my notes, and she whips out kids in foster care. Why are kids in foster care? It's like, well, it's the parents. They should be good people. Why do we have so many of those in foster care? And again, and again. It's not they come out one, because it's a repeat offense constantly with the foster care system. So we give them a chance, and then they fail again and again. So they try to do it themselves. What's that? The jails are full. Divorce rate. Suicide rate. Very good. The government does not take care of their own? Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. In town. Why do people, some people seem to be good without Christ? Because there's good people. Why do we think that they're good without Christ even? We don't have to have Christ to be good, right? Doesn't say that. How they were raised? I put they have real compassion for people. You can have compassion. You're kind of born with that. Um, maybe they're under the impression too that they just have to be good to go to heaven. So I'll just be good because that's my impression that I just I don't have to have salvation. I don't have to have Christ. I just got to be good. We've all heard that, right? 
So one thing I put in there, because I've got Marquis, who I call Marissa, down, is that she was bent more on pleasing people. You ever have a child, if some of you have children, that some are pleasing children to you? They like to please you, whatever they, and some kids, <laughs> they don't like to please you. You know, they're just on their own little channel. <laughs> they're on their own little channel over here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so you're right. Right, because we could look at cross-eyed at Marissa and she would behave, right? And so you got that cow. You could just look at them and whoop, they'd behave because um, they want to please you. And so I think there's people that are still that way that want to please and so one way of doing that is to be good and to volunteer or, or to whatever. So um, um, I'm not sure how much time I'm going to take on some of this. What makes them that way? I think we talked, you know, maybe how they were raised and they look to self to keep doing that. Um, um, and such goodness is acceptable to God. Why or not? Why not? Well, it, it's good. Um, but again, we'll, we're going to get more into this. I kind of really didn't want to answer this question because we're going to get into why it's not acceptable because it's still sin. They still have to be forgiven. You still have to have Christ, you know. So um, so how would you define sin? So I saw this, and I went, oh, boy, that's a good question. How do I define sin? What is sin? I got the Dictionary, I would have Googled it. It's quicker <laughs> for me. So this is what I this is what it is. An immoral, an immoral act considered to be a transgression against divine law. Okay, now what's transgression? <laughs> Go look that one up. An act that goes against a law, rule, or code of conduct. It's an offense. Okay, so that's what an ascent, uh, a, uh, a sin is. Okay, it's against the law. Or a code of conduct. It's you know it's a, it's offensive. So uh, the next question then is what? Why does it offend God? Why does sin offend God? I'm asking. God is good, so it goes against sin. Sin separates us. We're going to get into that. Say it again. We're breaking his rules. Right. The laws reflect his laws, reflect the moral purity of his nature. Therefore, the law is a reflection of the character of God. So if you so it is it is wrong to lie because God cannot lie, right? It is wrong to steal because God cannot steal, etc. The moral law is not arbitrary. It's based on God's holiness. So if we break those same laws, we're supposed to be like Christ-like. Any That's what we're working towards. If we're breaking those laws, that becomes a problem. Um, so let's d- discover the external principle. So let's get into that. was not even point one. Here we go. Point one. In Christ, we have fullness of God. Okay. In recent years, there's been more religion. Wicca is one, one. Neo-paganism, right, has become very popular in the West, okay? And so their primary teaching is um, that creation is sacred and that the earth should be worshipped and we must all strive to find the gods within us. And in doing so, we become gods our, uh, gods ourselves. So if you're constantly looking for that God inside of us or that looking towards you to fix your own problems, you're doing that. So, um, so Paul describes our relationship with God in a simpler and more straightforward term. So if you look in on um, verse 8 through 10, he talks about that, that it's real simple. Okay, If you want to experience the fullness of God, there is only one way to do that. Okay? You don't have to chant. You don't have to wear robes. Okay? You don't have to join a club. Okay? All that you have to do, this is what Paul, you know, it's real simple. All that you have to do to experience the fullness of God is to connect with him through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because Christ is the fullness of God. Okay? He's the fullness of him. Christ is not one little part of God. 
We don't keep striving to get more parts of that. We get that. We do not need to seek more and keep waiting for more. As you maybe grow in your faith, you think you're going to get more of God. It's not how it works. You get the fullness of God. Nothing's withheld. Everything's given to you. Okay? I think I actually have that. Christ is, you have the fullness of God. Nothing is withheld. I, when I saw this, I had to go back to some history because I'm like, okay, when Paul was talking to the Colossians, how long before or after, or how long was that period of time when Christ died from when he wrote those letters to Colossians? Okay, it was about 50 to 60 years. Don has this cool little map thing that tells you the timeline. It says prized possession. We got to spread it all out, so we got to look. I wanted to know that time because I'm like, 50 years, that's still, it's, it's really a short period of time, really. Because what you still had going on is you had the Pharisees still going on. You had to have. You know, uh, you had the Levites still um, doing all the religion um, and the Jews still doing the religion, religious acts. And the Colossians are going, man, we still have a lot of unanswered questions. It can't be just this simple. We have a lot of history that's telling us that we have to go to a temple. We've got to sacrifice. We've got to do blood offerings. I mean, there, there was just a lot of acts that you had to do, right, of you had to do this. You had to do this. There was a lot of laws. And uh, so I, think, I just think they're reading those letters, and they're trying to understand it can't be just that simple. Really, we just have to have faith in Christ. That's all we have to do is just to accept him. And, and I think of the jet commercials, those heads just blow off and purple spews all over, right? You just, all this stuff starts, you know, because I, I, I could imagine they, they had a hard concept of understanding that. They have so much of history. You know, now you take us 2,000 years and, you know, we're still struggling with us, people pulling us away from uh, the Scripture and that of we have a book that tells us everything that we need to know. So... But I'm glad it's that simple that we don't have to go through a myriad of tests like a citizenship to come into the United States, right? We've got to take a, a test, right? And if you, if you fail, you don't get to go, you know, and then it's like more tests to, to become. And it's just real simple. Um, so when you have a relationship with Christ, you have God. He, you have all that he has to offer. Nothing is withheld. You have access to him uh, day or night, any place. And I put on that on the go. We're on an on-go society. Can you imagine now if we had to go somewhere to a temple once a week or to whatever to do uh, to forgive us of our sins or whatever we wanted to communicate with God? I mean, we're so busy now, we surely wouldn't do it then. But now I have a 30-minute drive one way and then back home. You know, I get to fellowship with him anytime I want to. I can pray, I can worship, I can sing, and when a good song comes on the radio, whatever I want to do. I have now a personal relationship with him. I don't have to wait for, oh, it's Friday, I can go to the temple or whatever, and, you know, I don't have to wait for somebody else. I can do it myself, right? I have it in myself to do that. And so um, you have, um, when you have Christ, you have the Spirit living inside of you. Um, He comforts you, right? He teaches us. Uh, He convicts you of your sin that you have. And you can start to become, learn to become a better person. When you have a relationship with Christ, you have a God on your side. And he protects you through the storms of life, and he keeps you safe. When you have a relationship with Christ, you have the assurance that you will be with God in heaven throughout eternity. When you have a relationship with Christ, you have it all. There are no additional experiences that you need to seek, no additional truth outside the Scripture that you need to discover. So when you have Christ in you, you have the fullness of God. Oops, let me back up. So um, we have some questions. What are some, um, I think I covered that. I'm not sure. What are some hollow and deceptive philosophies you hear about on regular today? Um, I think we have, uh, everyone is good, right? We just talked about that. Just need to find your inner person. That's a big one. Um, You can do it yourself. There's a lot of that. 
What makes people like that? I'm going to go back up to two up there. What makes them hollow and deceptive? Those kind of things. Those kind of hollowness in their the ways they people, you know, you can be good and those kind of things. What's that? They don't work. That's right. Leave you empty. Yep. I put prideful because you're going to try to do it yourself, and it means it puts a pride thing on yourself to try to do it yourself. Then you become, oh, I just, I did it. Right? What are human traditions and basic principles of this word so misleading? Um, um, they're always this, uh, we, well, let me go over that question. I know in ways that Christ radically different from those two things, and that is he's, he's the same always. He's always been the same. We have this book. It's, always, it's not changing, okay? Um, it's always uh, the same. Um, I'm going to go over a couple questions. I'm going to travel on. You got my notes, so you can look at those. Um, that. So when we have the fullness in Christ, we need to have that affect us in our daily uh, walk. We have his power. We have his full power, right? So... I kind of put down here, how does this affect your day-to-day life? Man, if we've got the full power of God, we should be using that. We should be using our gifts on a daily, daily basis, what we gifts that we have, right? He's, it's inside of us all the time. We should just be using it, not on just Sunday morning, if you're worshiping, but to um, on a daily basis, at work, at home, wherever. Whatever your gift is, what he, the power that he's given you. So, of course, Don gives me notes and he goes, I'm reading through the notes and it says illustration. I said, oh, great. <laughs> I get to do an illustration. So before we get into the part two, I wanted to just do this illustration. It was kind of interesting. Illustration kind of give you a visual. Myself, I'm very visual. I have a jar of water here full, representing your heart and your mind, which has sin in it. So it's pretty good and full, right? One way to combat that is to start to take and place in things into your heart or in your mind that are God or Christ-like. So we have prayer life. We will come back and maybe we have worship on Sundays and we pray and, and we sing and we have worship. We're putting more into our mind. Maybe we start to have a Bible study. We read in our Bible daily, right? So we're putting more things in, into our heart and into our mind. As you can start seeing, it's starting to overflow. And I've got some more stuff here. Whatever you want to put. Maybe you're serving here in the church. You've got a ministry going, okay? See how many more I can get in there? I think I can get one more in there. So we took a lot of sin back out of our heart and out of our minds. What I kind of liked that when I when I saw that that analogy, I thought, well, also too, if those things are in there, not much more can come in. Now we have a lot less area, right? If I were to take this, that space that now is in here is a lot less than what it was before, right? So if we keep that in there, we're going to keep that sin a lot less sin into that area. As well, I um, thought well, that was very, a very good uh, analogy of of that. Uh, we have that in our hearts, and we all know that if when we're in prayer, <laughs> when we're in church, and we're worshiping and all that, everything just seems to go well. You know, we always want to try to. We know when it doesn't, and we know we need to get back again, and so we start that <laughs> that cycle. So the second point is that Christ, in Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins. Okay? In Christ, we have forgiveness of sins. To believe in forgiveness, though, you first must believe that there's sin. Because <laughs> if there's no forgiveness, then I, nobody needs to forgive me. I haven't done anything wrong, right? It's the same thing. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a good person. So why do I need forgiveness? If you believe that you haven't sinned, there is no need to ask for forgiveness. Otherwise, why ask? 
the fact that God offers us forgiveness is evidence that we need forgiveness. He offers it to us. And so that means we, there's something wrong. We've done something wrong. So, and it states in the Bible in Romans 3, 2, and we've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God or of that mark. We all have. Demon little, demon little children that we have that run around. I've had a lot. <laughs> and uh, they don't come out good. A lot of people think, oh, he's a good little kid. No, he ain't. He ain't good. Because they're always bent towards sin stuff. They, you know, oh, I'd like to ever see in a nursery a one- or a two-year-old on the ground playing toys, and one goes, oh, here, have my toy. I'll play with another thing. You know, and, oh, no, it's a scrap fight. It's around, and I'm fighting and pitching a fit and punching, and i got to have my toy, right? And so we are not born with goodness on our heart. You know, it's, it's sin We right from the beginning. So we, God had to have a plan of what that was going to be. We started off with one plan. We went to an, I shouldn't use that because Donna said, but there is never, ever a plan B. I know that, but we started in the Old Testament, and then it changed of how he could get people to say, you know, come to Christ without, a, without the laws. Okay? So there's a story of a guest preacher who stepped up to the pulpit at church one time. I can do that right here with you guys. So however many people in, um, he would, uh, he goes, let me begin by asking a question. How many of you ever at any point in your life said something that wasn't 100% accurate? Of course, everyone raised their hands, right? He went on to say, how many of you have ever in your point of life have ever lied? And everybody would, most people would raise their hand. And then he said, well, then I guess I'm in the midst of a bunch of liars and thieves. Because we all have. And so we have all sinned, and none of us are perfect, okay? And we all have the same experiences. We know the right thing to do and did the wrong thing anyways. We, you know, we've all been there. Or we know the right thing to do, and we did nothing at all. That's a big one, too. Um, we have all sinned, and that we need God's for, forgiveness. And so if we... Um, we read um, Colossians uh, chapter 2 again, 11 through 15. In him also you, have, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And... Um, and so another verse I put out here is John 1.9, 1 John 1.9. 1 and it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. If, if, you, we, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so, um, yeah. There's the two verses there before John. In fact, if your attitude is, how much can I get away with, we need to question whether we have fully sought Christ's forgiveness at all. So I'm going to go back to a personal analogy with my family. Sorry that my sons are here, but how many times have we heard, hey, John, you know, um, Let's see if I can get the analogy right. He, you know, we um, do the dishes or put this away, and or he did something and he goes, "I'm sorry." Well, the next day he does the same thing again, and I'm sorry. I do the same thing again the next day. I'm sorry. Are you really sorry? Because I don't see a change. Right? I don't see a change. There's got to be something with that. If I say that I'm sorry, that means. You, Okay, so then you're not going to do it. That's my expectation. You're not going to do it the next time, right? And so um, we, um, we have that expectation. So, um, so which of the sins did God forgive? The ones uh, that you've committed in the past? Yeah, we can say that, right? What about the ones in the future? The ones you'll commit tomorrow? And the next day, 
and the next day. He has forgiven us, yes. When he died on the cross, though, he paid the price for all of our sins. You may ask, are you saying that if I commit a sin tomorrow, it's already guaranteed that I'll be forgiven? Yes. Does that mean I can sin all I want and still be forgiven? No. (laughs) Just because your car can do 110 miles an hour down the road... You can fly down the road at 110 miles an hour, but I don't think that means it's a good idea to drive it that fast. Now, all your speeding tickets have been paid for already by Christ. They've been paid for. But really, you're going to do 110 mile an hour down. um, Let's pick a good road. I'm thinking of, uh, oh, even Schimmel. My goodness. (laughs) You know, it's just not a wise thing to do. I mean, yes, your car will do 110 miles an hour. That's fine. But, man, you're sure not serving anyone. You're not. You're just, yeah, you're, you could, a tire could fall off and crash and burn, and, you know, and you're just, you're just going fast. And, yes, your tickets are all paid for, but you're surely not benefiting anything from that. And, again, it's not a heart change. It's, you're, again, you're back to that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, if you're really sorry or if you've really forgiven your sins, then, um, or you want them forgiven, then you need to, or we're questioning whether we really truly have Christ and that you're living for him. Um, there are still consequences to deal with. Every sin has a built-in consequence to it, every sin. And so it doesn't matter what it is, there's going to be a consequence. It may not be immediate but it's going to affect, and it can affect all kinds of families, and we've probably all been there, right? That something, somebody else's cause has caused just a tremendous amount of, of pain and suffering on that. So there's always consequences. So they're just built in. Just because God has promised to forgive your sins doesn't mean that it's a good idea to go out and commit sins. There are still consequences to deal with. And again, so God promises to forgive us. Do not Um, doesn't give us an excuse to sin, but it does give us a reason to feel secure. Yeah, I'm going down the road kind of fast. I know the tickets are kind of paid. Does it kind of make it secure? Kind of, but as we we know we're going to sin or drop that ball, and we don't have to feel feel huge amount of guilt and, you know, and and taking that a lot from people or whatever. Um, So when we fall short of the mark, we can be rest assured that God in his mercy will forgive us completely through Christ. Okay? Um, I like, uh, I, I, I pulled something out, and I thought it was, it was great. Because and, and, I wanted to, before I get into the second, uh, the third part, which is in Christ we have freedom in the law, is that um, the follower of Christ, the avoidance of sin, is to be accomplished out of love of God and love for others, okay? So the avoidance of sin, how do we, how do, we do that? Is accomplished out of love of God and love of others. Love is to be our motivation. We want to love, right? We, are recogni- we recognize the value of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. Our response is to be loved or to love, gratitude and obedience to him. When we understand the sacrifice Jesus made, for us and others, our response is to be follow his example in pressing love into others. Our motivation for overcoming sin should be love, not a desire to legalistically obey a series of commandments. We are to obey the law of Christ because he, we love him, not so that we can check off a list of command, commands that we have successfully obeyed. So it's out of love. We're loving Christ. We're obeying Him. We are recognizing and being obedient and grat- uh, grac- or have gratitude towards Him for dying for those sins. The law then, the law, and what we talked about was the moral purity. In the Old Testament, the law of God, it's a perfect standard. The law in the Old Testament was a, was a perfect standard. They had a mark, and these were laws that, that, were, that were given. And so I'm going to go through this stuff here. Um, And I put this on the web too. Which of the following statements best represents what 
our attitude should be towards sin. I know I will sin, so I don't worry about it. You know, we take a look at these. Sometimes you see what one you kind of follow. I know I will sin, but I confess anything that I know is wrong and so forth. What's, which statement is the closest to being true, and how do you know which of those affect you? Our motivation for overcoming sin, I talked about that. That came from Matt uh, Slick. On, I found it out there online. It, I thought it was very, very good of how, how that is. And because um, the law, we had the Old Testament law, and everybody had to follow that law. Well, when Christ died and it was changed, the law had changed, it became a law of love. Okay? So if we... Um, if we look at Colossians then 2, 14 and 15, he goes back into, um, by canceling the record of debt and stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by trumpeting over them. So if we go back to 14, it says, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That was the law of the Old Testament. Okay? The re- written code refers to the law in the Old Testament and the list of do's and don'ts. It was huge. I think it's 613 is the last count I took. The problem with the law is that it refuses to grade on a curve. All of you in this first row, I mean... You know, you, you couldn't do this. Here's the law. This is what it stated. You cannot wear mixed clothing. You're out, you're out, you're out, you're out, you're out, you're out. That was one of the laws. You cannot mix clothing. She can't have wool on top and polyester on the bottom. I think they had polyester back then. <laughs> Cotton on top, something on the bottom. That was It's in Deuteronomy. It's crazy. So there's no curve that, oh, we'll maybe give Jim a little chance there. He he was pretty close. It, well, there's no curve on this. It was set. It was a perfect mark. You had to meet that mark. <laughs> and they struggled with, with that, you, as you can imagine. Um, so a 92% may be an A in school, but it doesn't work like that here. You're not even close. If you read James um, 2.10, 2, um, For whatever keeps the whole law but fails it in one point has become accountable for it all. One failure, you're done on the law. So the bad, that's that's terrible. No one can keep 100% of the time. It was impossible. And they had some crazy laws. If you ever go online and read some of the crazy laws that they had, I was like, well, I don't even know how you could even keep that. You can't breed two different cattle together. I talked about can't mix the clothing, and there was all kinds of weird ones. And then um, (laughs) another one was uh, rebelling against your parents. That was stoning right there. It says that right there. I'm like, I like that one. I'll just where's my stones at? I'll just I'll just hold them out on their rooms, right? I'll stone you. So there was all these kind of laws. And um, that was the perfect standard, was that laws that they, he had set up. And we fail, when we fail to keep the law, we sin. Okay? When we sin, we offend God. Right? Because, again, he cannot lie. He does not lie. Uh, you offend God because it is his law that you have, uh, have broken. The offense against God results in a judgment. So once you have committed an offense against God, now we're into judgment. Laws are laws because they have penalties. There's a penalty to a law. If you break the law, you're going to go to jail. There's a penalty for that. Okay? There is no law without a penalty. Okay? Therefore, breaking God's law brings judgment, which is a separation from God, whoever said that, it's correct. It's a separation from God. Once we break that law, we have judgment and a penalty against us. That separates us from God. 
Therefore, breaking God's laws brings judgment with the separation from God, but your sins have been made a separation between you and your God. It's the same thing. The sin has then caused that separation. That's in Isaiah 59.2. And the wages of sin is death. Great. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep these law. Today, we have sinned, and so the wages of sin is death. Well, that's not what I want. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to die. So to sin, to break God's law, results in a judgment. Again, we talked about that. The judgment is known as damnation. There's the judgment. Once you've committed a sin, you have a judgment, which is then is known as a damnation, which is in the righteous judgment of God upon the sinner. If God did not judge the sinner, then he is not upholding his holiness. So if you didn't judge people and you just let people do whatever you want, he's, he's no different than any other uh, false god. And he would allow and he would be allowing sinners to go unpunished. So he really wouldn't have sin then if he's not going to have any kind of uh, penalty or, or judgment for that. So, of course, Jesus has taken our place and has died for our sins. So he's, he's, he's that immediator right between there and says, hey, wait a minute, I paid it. I've taken care of that sin. Let's keep that communication going between me and God. Because once you don't have that, so how do you have that? By having a personal relationship with God and having that faith in Christ that he did die on your sin. Uh, and that's part of the salvation message, right? That I, he has died on the cross for me and for my sins, the ones that I've committed before and present for everybody. Okay? So that I still now have a relationship with him. If I don't have that, then I don't have a relationship. So I was thinking about that, and I'm like, and it, okay, so... We don't, you know, we had faith in him, and I think we go back to that. Did you really have faith then if you're sinning and things are not happening and blessings and those kind of things? Do we, you know, are we truly repenting of those sins and having a true communications with him? Or is that getting broken? And then we're having judgment against us. And so he died on the, on the cross uh, for us. So through Christ, we... We have been forgiven, and through Christ, God has done away with the written call, code. They only serve to condemn us and has given us a new law to live by, right? The law of love. Okay? So what is the law of love? <laughs> Pretty easy. Love God with all your being. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you just take those two things, it'll just, it makes things a lot easier in life. It was actually better than the whole burnt offerings when you do that. It's actually mentioned in Mark 12. He even states that, that loving your God with all your being and loving your neighbor as yourself, that it was better than any of the burnt offerings that they did in the Old Testament. Just by those two things, of any burnt offering. see where I want to go with this discussion. What does it mean that God has canceled the written code that opposed us? We kind of talked about that. That we're not going to be any longer judged by the law that we have to keep. I always, um, I love reading the, the, the New Testament, especially when Christ was on his mission and doing um, doing miracles. He was just playing with those Pharisees constantly. And, and not tricking them, but just getting them to eat their own words. And really, you know, you guys are so full of your religion, you can't do this. You know, would you rather save a goat in a hole than go to save a person? And, you know, and just, and, and just really working that religion part to say, you know what, that's no longer needed, that religion part of that, that stuff that you guys are constantly doing, that's what makes you righteous is the works that you're doing constantly, you know. And that, uh, um, I just love, love reading that, that he, he was doing that constantly with them. And uh, so uh, um, another question, what does it never, uh, why does it never ultimately work just to make a bunch of rules for ourselves? Marla? 
Anybody have any idea about that? What is it? Why does it never ultimately work that we make a bunch of rules of ourselves? Wouldn't we? What's that? You're going to break them anyways? <laughs> I'd probably make them easier because I'm lazy. <laughs> I wouldn't want to make them too hard. <laughs> I would, yeah, I'd make them to fit what I want, right? And probably, yeah, won't be able to keep them anyways. Um, so, James 2.20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? I think we caught that a couple of weeks, even last, about faith and works, right? Make sure we get them the right way, that we don't do works to get faith. I think a lot of people, good people want to try to do that. Just do the works and I'll be good and then I'll be able to go to heaven. First, you have to have faith, and then from out of faith then comes the good works that you do. And he's talking about foolish. Are you foolish that you think you can just do works without the faith? Because sometimes I think it's some, when we do uh, ministry work in that, <laughs> we do get tired, and it's by faith that we keep doing our, our ministry because it's always never, um, always pleasant. And so... Um, What do you think James 20 means to us? And we said that. Um, how does this show us our complete need for Christ? Well, again, we've all fallen short. We're, we're, you know, there, there's not enough good that you can do to get yourself to heaven. You can't. There is none. You are going to need to rely on him. What does it mean that every, everything is permissible? 1 Corinthians 6.12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. It's a good verse. Everything's lawful. You can go rob a bank. You can go overeat. You can rack your debt right up. You can... Um, Name some other things. I can drive 100 mile an hour. So everything's permissible, everything's lawful, but not all things are helpful. Really? You're going to do 110 miles? Is that really helpful? So we can do anything we want. According to that verse, how can we decide what we should engage in or not? What should be our measure or whether something is beneficial or not? This is, you know, this is always a question. Should I do that? Should I, will that benefit anything? Am I, what am I going to get out of that? You know, um, are we looking at what am I going to benefit out of it? That's a problem. Yeah, does it please God? Is that one of the questions we can answer? Does it please God if we're going to engage in something? Or is it going to engage in something that then turns you into a slave? Well, I'm going to become a bass fisherman. We're, hey, hey, I'm talking about Adam now. I'm sorry, dude. Yeah. Is that beneficial? But guess what? I bought the boat. I bought everything. Now I'm on the lake every night. Okay. If you turn back and look at that, Kind of enslaved to that. I got a master now. It's that water in that boat. I don't think that's beneficial to anybody. Sure there is. What is that? What's the consequence? You know the home life is going to suffer. Very much so. What's that? Right. Right. <laughs> So it's kind of hard. Yeah, so do we start to become enslaved to something? How can we know that we are being mastered by something? That's a good question. Tammy had some good insight on this. Do we hide it? 
I had him sneaking out at midnight trying to fish in the light with the flashlight. <laughs> Does it come before anything else? I ain't coming to church Sunday, are you, Adam? You're going to be out in the boat. So we got to be really careful of that. Is it going to be beneficial? Is it going to enslave us? problem is I think sometimes I think we go down the road thinking we're not going to be enslaved and then we're snared. And I think that's where accountability is and our brothers here need to help with that. Seriously. Dude, really? You need to be at church. Or what are you struggling with? You seem to be, you know, not focused or what, you know, what's, what's kind of bothering you? What do you? Something got you and snared over here as a slave? Something, you know, something's over you or a master over you. You know, so what is that? So, so some deep things. Sin. Um, the other part, apply our findings, what we talked about tonight. In Christ, we have everything we need. God's fullness, unconditional forgiveness, total freedom. We just got to understand that. We got to just press into that and understand that, I think. That would help so much that we do have his full power. Reminds me of the Jeremy Camp song, his new one, Same, same Power. You ever heard that? He talks about Lazarus, the same power that raised Lazarus. We have that same stuff in us. I surely like to know how to use it. I mean, that's what I'm, we're trying to learn is how do, how do you do that? How do you learn that power? And uh, to whatever that's a healing hand or, or just, you know, even the word, you know, I'm, you know, that's what I've been asking for is how do, how do we, I, I want to encourage somebody or how do I get somebody a word? How do I understand how to do that, right? Well, we've got it. We just need to press in. All the things that worldly philosophies try to promise, God has already delivered. He's already delivered it. We just need to follow this thing right here and we'll be fine. You don't have to pretend that sin doesn't exist. It exists. Quit pretending it doesn't. We all do it, and, but we're glad that he's forgiven it, us what we've done yesterday and then also tomorrow, right? We have that assurance. We have that freedom. You don't have to talk yourself into not feeling guilty. Talked about that a little bit, feeling guilty about it. We have a great place right up here on Sunday mornings. Come up there and get rid of it. You can acknowledge these things and turn them over to Christ, and he will forgive you without fail. Right? Then, then what happens with them, right? They're gone. Except for he doesn't even know about them anymore. Gone. And I think we dwell on that a little bit. Oh, man, I forgot about that yesterday. I, you know, i got to ask for that. And we kind of keep that in our past, right, about that other sin. We can't let that go. He's let it go. You need to let it go. It's gone. It's done. We need to move on. This gives you total freedom, not freedom to sin, <laughs> but freedom to strive to become like Jesus. So he's not, yeah, he is the fullness of God as well, so he's not going to lie and all those things. He's going to be holiness and he's going to love. And so that's, that's the law that we need to be following is that love law. All right, think about one thing that is a master over you. We talked about master and slave. Think about that one thing in your life that's got, is a master over you. Spend time in prayer asking God to forgive to give you his power in that area. If it's in us, we're going to be able to forget, overcome it, right? We talked about that, fullness. We can't do it ourselves. We've got to have him. So we need to rely on that power to have him take us out of that enslavement that we have against something or, you know, for something else. And that's hard. I mean, we, we can get snared up. If anyone um, would like to ask prayer on that, you know, um, especially especially this church, you just ask and we'll definitely, we'll pray over you on that because we all struggle with something on that. What is that? And you may need time to think about that and what that big one is that's enslaving you. And you may need to come and ask for some um, prayer from one of our elders and, um, and just feel free to do that because um, you need to get that, that, in, that other master out of your life and have Christ be your master and to uh, worship him and and uh, again, we need to be against that tide. I'll just wrap up. 
is that, uh, again, we talked about the, the title of the sermon series is Against the Tide. And the Colossians were doing that. They were going right against the tide that everybody else was telling them to do, and they're saying, no, it's very simple. We can have faith in Christ ourselves, our personal relationship with him. And you can do that today, and you're going to be against the tide. You're going to be against society and what they're teaching of all that other stuff that's going on in, in the world today. It's going to be, you're going to go against the t- tide, and it's not going to be a nice, smooth tide. Unfortunately, it's going to be a rough tide to get through. And so, um, and that uh, to think like Christ, that was my um, heading, was to think like Christ or to think like a Christian, right? So we need to think like him, to be Christ-like. That's what a Christian means, is to be Christ-like, to think about him. So think about the sins, that you're grateful for that, pray for that. Thank him for that, that you are thankful for that he has forgiven your sins, to have freedom in that. And then, again, that we are, we don't, we're not underneath the law anymore. Okay, we're not underneath that law. We're underneath the law of love. And let's see how that works in our lives and that we do have his fullness in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just again thank you for this evening. Um, I just want to bless everyone that's here tonight and give them safe travels back home. And as, again, just as we opened up your word tonight, uh, to share that uh, you did provide a way for us to have a right relationship with you and that there was no gap, there was no judgment, that you, you sent your son down to, to forgive of all sins, that we can still have a relationship with you on a personal basis, that we can have your power in us and that we do, Lord. That if we have you and that uh, we commit to you, Lord, and that we ask us you into our hearts, and that we have faith in you, that you have forgiven us of our sins, that again, that we uh, thank you for that, that what you've done in our lives. And again, we just thank you for this evening and all that you do in our lives. In your name we pray, amen.